Thank you for joining us for the What's New in SolidWorks 2011. Today it's going to be part three, and it's going to be an in-depth look at weldments, large-scale design, and e-drawings, among some other things. The overview that we're going to take a look at is uh, the first thing we're going to see the improvements in weldments, then e-drawings. We're going to see some new enhancements with importing and exporting of uh, different file types. We're going to take a look at some mold design improvements, SolidWorks utilities, and then the large-scale design. Starting with weldments, uh, a couple of new things that we're going to see here are weld beads, um, different way of making your standard weldment, uh, the old fillet bead. Uh, now we have uh, weld beads, and that's going to be more of a uh, lightweight type of version of the uh, old fillet bead. We'll also take a look at some of the new cut list options and then see the support and drawings with the new weld tools. I want to start by showing the old way of adding in a fillet bead inside of our SolidWorks here. Um, now it's so considered so old that it's not even on the weldment toolbar if you look at it. You have to go to the insert pull down, uh, find your weldments, and then you have your fillet bead inside of there. The old way of doing this was just by selecting a couple of faces. So you have face, select, uh, face 1, face 2, and then you have whatever size the fillet uh, bead is here uh, that you want to put in there. So I'm just going to leave it as it is, say OK. You can see that it puts it in there and it looks, you know, gives it the little weld uh, bitmap that's on there. It puts the weld symbol in here and everything. Um, the problem with this is that if you look at it, inside of our cut list we have our two components in here. This is just a multi-body part. But then it also adds another body and it's of that weld bead. So if we hide everything else, there's your weld bead. You can uh, actually take uh, measurements on it and everything if you wanted to. It's just filling in the, the gap that we had in here. But what that would will do is it will actually really um, add a lot of overhead to the part itself. So what they want to do is get away from that and that's where they came up with the weld bead uh, tool. We'll take a look at that in just a second. I want to first take a look at an assembly. I have two different components inside of here and show you a couple of different things here as well. Just going to start with the basics and then uh, move up from there. Uh, if you joined us for the last webinar, you learned that we can have uh, we can add fillets and chamfers inside of our um, inside of our assemblies now, and we also have the weld bead, so we'll take a look at that in a second. I'm going to start with the chamfer, uh, say quarter inch, it's fine. I'm going to add it to one of the edges here, hit OK, and then I'll go ahead and add a second chamfer in here, just to the other side. So with that, it's the exact same thing that we had as a part, but what we want to do is go ahead and add a weld bead inside of here. So if you pull down the assembly features, you have weld bead, um, the way to create a weld bead is just by selecting two different faces. So you have the faces to weld one of these blue boxes here. So first face, second face. You can see the uh, edge that's going inside there. Then you can give it your uh, uh, weld bead itself. There we go, quarter of an inch. And say OK. So if it's a quarter, it's just inside of there. We'll take a look at a couple of other examples here in uh, just a moment. Here we have another, um, just some, some sort of frame, and it has a bunch of pieces that need to be welded together. Let's take a look at the weld bead a little further here. Um, the tool itself looks a little, uh, it kind of looks like what you would have with the structural uh, members when you input them. So you have the weld path up here, you have your settings, your weld section uh, selection here. So let's just say I want to select one face, then a second face. You can see the edge that's common between them, but then you have some options inside of here. You can uh, change your, uh, just from your selection, so the common edge between the two, or you can say both sides are all around. In this case, I'll choose all around, and that will allow us to create the weld bead going around the entire uh, tube member. So I'm just going to start by hitting OK. 
And you can see with that that it adds our weld bead here. Now what that looks like, if I try to section this away, is it looks like just kind of like a shell, like a surface of the weld bead itself. And what it's going to do is just be basically a lightweight version of the fillet bead that we just uh, took a look at. So that's kind of what, what they ended up doing. It's a, a lot less overhead than what the extra body does. And we'll see where we can add a couple of extra um, uh, different properties to it as well. So let's just try that again. I'm just going to come down here to where we have some sort of groove. Let's go ahead and add another one, weld bead. Just going to select the two faces again. And I'm going to say all around, just like I did before. Now we do have a couple of... Uh, different options in here as well. We can also say uh, define weld symbol. So if you wanted to add that right away, you can. We'll just say it's for a V groove and that's good enough. Hit OK. Hit OK again. And that fills it in with the V groove, uh, with the weld bead. Let's also take a look down here. If you notice, we have a gap between these two members. Now anyone out there who's tried this with a fillet bead before will uh, probably remember getting an error message because SolidWorks couldn't fill in a gap before. Now if we use the weld bead, I'm going to say all around again just like I did before. The weld bead tool, since it is a lightweight version of the fillet bead, it'll do it automatically. So that, that's a pretty nice improvement over uh, what it used to be. Let's take a look at just uh, this gusset here. Again, go back to the weld bead. I'm going to select two faces. I'm going to say in this case, maybe it's going to be on both sides. So you're on both sides of the gusset. You can see that. And we have a couple of different options at the bottom here. From two length and then the intermittent weld. If you go to the intermittent weld, you can say, you know, the gap in weld length. You can say the pitch in weld length. It's up to you. Um, We'll just leave it at that. You can stagger it if you want to as well. If you hit OK, that's kind of what it looks like there. And then let's do this once more and check out the other option that we had there. Again, I'm going to say on both sides. And I'm going to say from to length. And you can either select the start point and the end point, uh, choose the weld length, but you also have these arrows on the screen where you can move those. And that will give you your overall weld uh, length itself. So hit OK and there it is. Now that we've added in all of those weld beads, what we can do is take a look at the uh, weld folder. And what it's going to do is have all of the different types of welds that we just added, those weld beads. So you have the, uh, the 6.35 millimeter fillet weld, then the V-groove one, and then we have a second one up over here. What we can do is right click on one of those and go to the properties. You can see the folders on the left hand side, so it's just the different types of welds. Um, what we can do is add in different properties, so weld material, you know, put in whatever it is, the process that you're going to weld, the unit, uh, the weld mass per unit length. You can uh, do the cost per unit mass, you can do the welding time, all that stuff to help out your welders and uh, get the information in there. We'll see a couple of, uh, of where that's going to come in handy, all those different properties, in just a couple minutes here. What I want to do here is take a look at the assembly now. And what that's going to look like is this. And what we can do is, uh, just like we did in the uh, part itself, we can go in here and we can go to the weld bead, just like we saw with that simple part earlier. and uh, just like we did before, choose the two faces. I'm going to say all around. And we can then say, uh, and this is where it gets pretty similar to what it would look like with um, just adding in new structural members. You can then also, instead of just getting out of the tool and going back in, you can say new weld path. So if you click on it, it's going to keep the same properties as what you had before. And uh, then you can continue and, and uh, add more and more uh, weld paths to that. What's also pretty unique about this is underneath the weld path up here, we do also have uh, the smart weld selection tool is what they call it. If you click on it, you are now kind of toggled into that mode. 
Now if you look at my cursor, it's a pencil, and what I can do is start by just drawing a line. You can see that the line starts as blue. As soon as I cross over to another face, it turns black, meaning it's figured out a way to create the weld bead based on my selection. So where I draw the line, that's where it adds the weld bead itself. So I'm just going to do that a couple more times. And this is a pretty quick and easy way of adding different weld beads. Sometimes if you grab the wrong thing, it will uh, kind of yell at you. And it will, I'm sure I'll, I'll show you that in a second here. But just grab a few things here. Hit OK. Yeah, an invalid selection somewhere. That usually happens when I'm doing this. You hit OK. There we go. I think it was just that angled one that I did up here. But just added in a few of them, and uh, if you look at it, I mean, it's a pretty quick and easy way of doing this as well. Uh, the last thing I want to take a look at is inside the drawing itself. We do have a few different options inside of here that we can uh, take a look at. Let's start with the cut list itself. Now, pretty standard cut list that we put in here, a weldment cut list. If you look at it, we have a couple of different mounting pads here, and it's kind of in end caps and gussets, and those are all kind of scattered in with the rest of the uh, structural steel members. What if you want to put all of those kind of together in the chart itself, and then have all the structural members together? Well, before you would have to kind of uh, reorder things, and, uh, and you know, it's kind of an ugly way of doing it. You'd, you can delete and move, uh, you know, different rows and add things in or whatever. But they've made it a little easier where all you have to do is click, drag, and drop. And it's going to allow you to move all those components uh, as to wherever you want them to be. And what's nice is it's going to update your item number and the balloons. You don't have to really worry about that uh, anymore. Let's also add in, now that we have the weld beads, we also have a weld table. So I'm just using the standard template. You can change this as well, just like you can with a bill material template or anything like that. And what we're doing here is just placing our, our weld here. And you can see the different the size, the symbol, the weld length, the material. And again, this is what I put in, the weld material. Uh, just steal for that uh, the, the one option there. But you can put in whatever you want here. You can expand on the table itself, and it makes it uh, pretty nice and a, a nice easy way to kind of uh, keep all your welds together in one spot. You can also add in a couple of different things to your uh, to your parts here uh, or to your drawing. You can go to your insert model items and you have an option here and I'm just going to say import into this view and I'm going to say all uh, the entire model but we have an option in here under annotations uh, that we can add in weld symbols right from our model so if you added those in you can see where it's adding those weld uh, symbols here if you put them into your your part and it's just a little bit of a cleanup effort after after you uh, put them in there but It'll point right to where you added all those different uh, weld beads. So that's a, a nice way of um, adding a lot of information inside of your uh, into your drawings, and it's a nice tool, I think, for uh, for weldments. Next, we have e-drawings, and we're going to take a look at the uh, display enhancements with e-drawings, some file synchronization, triad manipulation. A uh, standard triad that you see in SolidWorks is inside eDrawings, and you can manipulate parts and components and that kind of stuff with that. We're going to see the filter, similar to uh, what we see in uh, at the top of the feature or assembly tree inside of SolidWorks. We'll see that inside of eDrawings now. And also, something new in 2011, we have native 64-bit support with our eDrawings uh, professional and standard. As we look at eDrawings, there are a couple of things to notice. First, just looking at the desktop icons I have here, um, mentioned that there's uh, native 64-bit support for eDrawings now, but I also have eDrawings 2011, the 32-bit version on my system. Now what that does is uh, the 32-bit version has to be installed, 
so that anytime you use um, SolidWorks Explorer, if you use any uh, eDrawings previews inside of there, it uses the 32-bit application. So if you're a 64-bit user and you know, so you have two different eDrawings, that's the reason why. Let's take a look at our model here. Um, some of the different things that have changed um, inside of eDrawings is first, uh, there's some better display enhancements and I'm not going to really show that. It's more for uh, if you open up um, a DXF or a DWG file, it just shows it more accurately uh, just like you would look at it inside of AutoCAD. Um, the display order used in AutoCAD, it's uh, more closely resembles that. So that's what, what that'll do for you. There's also some, one other thing I won't uh, really show here. File synchronization. If you have um, opened up a SOLIDWORKS assembly inside of your eDrawings and maybe you uh, created the eDrawing file from that, um, if you go back to your SOLIDWORKS file and you make some changes to it, eDrawings might actually be able to pick that up now. And if you do that inside of your eDrawing file, there's going to be a watermark uh, that's shown um, just on your screen here. Uh, just if it's out of date for whatever reason. So that's uh, the file synchronization part of it. Uh, one other thing here, um, let's take a look at this. Inside of our feature tree here, our assembly tree, we have a filter just like we have in SOLIDWORKS. If you want to type something in, maybe pin, something like that, we do have a filter in here that you can use so you can click on whatever you want for the uh, the pin here. Maybe you want to just uh, hide all the other components. So you see just that pin. Yeah, it's up to you, but it's it's nice to have a filter there. And if you want to go back, you can just get rid of everything inside of that field. Um, you can do a couple of other things here that you couldn't do in years past. Uh, so if you just select this part here, you can select uh, move and you have the option just like you have in SOLIDWORKS to move with the triad so if you want to do that you can just pull this part up maybe you can uh, rotate it around there we go and then that looks that looks okay but you have the options in here for the free drag you can use um, the triad or you can just enter values if you want to as well uh, for rotational XYZ or if you just move it There have been some changes with the importing and exporting of files, specifically with the DXF and DWG import uh, wizard. Now we can see a couple of the different options that they added inside of 2011. Let's take a look at that first, and then we'll also see exporting sheet metal parts to a DXF or a DWG uh, as well. The easiest way to import a DWG or DXF file is if you go to your open dialog, uh, search to the directory that you want to, uh, that you have your DWG file in. I'm just going to select it and then say open. And then what we want to do is uh, use the import wizard, which is this screen that just popped up here. We're going to import it into a new part as a 2D sketch. So far, this is all the same as what it's always been. And then what we have is uh, the option to add constraints at the top. We'll turn that on. That's always been there as well. And then we can uh, select what layers we want to pull in as well. I'm just going to pull in the, the zero layer. That's our base uh, geometry. Hit next. And then this is where it gets uh, to have a lot of new things that are inside of 2011 that weren't there before. The first thing is at the top here, merge overlapping entities. If you check that on, if you've imported DWG files inside of SOLIDWORKS before, you'll, you would notice that a lot of times um, the lines might be on top of each other. This option here will allow those lines to be merged into a single entity. Uh, it doesn't work for lines that are point to point though, um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind. We also have the option down here to run repair sketch, and we'll see what that looks like in just a second. But then something else that's really nice and it's kind of, uh, and it is new here. If you look at our origin, it's way down kind of off in space here. You have the option to define your sketch origin, which should save you a nice step. Uh, I'm just going to kind of click towards the center there, and that's okay. Uh, it'll just save you a step of having to move everything from off into space back into, uh, you know, some place closer to the origin that you want there. So that's nice.
you also have the options to remove some entities if you wanted to uh, right from here. Um, so you can do that, select the different uh, you know, different parts here, different uh, entities. You grab those two, say remove entities, and then you know maybe that's fine. Let's go ahead and finish this. And it's just asking whether I want to explode the block entities. I'm going to just say no. I want to keep them as they are right now. And it's just going through the import process. Now something that you'll notice uh, that shows up right away, let me just move my toolbar off to the side, is uh, we have our repair sketch. And that was that option that we have for repair sketch. If you've ever used it, it shows up just like this. It's going to use the magnifying glass to show you where some issues are. Let me just turn off my sketch relations. Makes it easier to see. So you can kind of take a look in here and see um, you know, what the issues might be. Just sort of delete this guy out. Let's just recreate that. Make it a single entity. That's fine. And if you hit refresh, it should now say that there's nine instead of ten issues showing. It looks like we got a couple of lines that need to be deleted, so I'm just going to delete those out. If we hit refresh again, it's down to five. Here's another one. We're down to three. So simple enough, just kind of going around, cleaning up the part, and then once you see one of one, you can refresh, and it now says no problems found. Now, what happens if you want to run this after you get into your part, but you didn't hit that checkbox um, as you put it in there, or as you uh, did the, uh, the wizard? Well, if you look on your sketch toolbar, it's right up here, right next to your display delete relations. It's just called repair sketch. Now what this is looking for is a proper sketch for SolidWorks. So if it was trying to create a, you know, some sort of extrude or revolve, something like that, what it's looking for is proper geometry and lines that don't intersect and do, you know, strange things like that. So with what we have here, you know, it may, may not be exactly what your, uh, uh, what your intention is for the part, but it, that's what it's looking for here. So for this one, that looks okay, and uh, that's all we need to do. While exporting a sheet metal part to a D DXF or DWG, we have a couple of uh, options in here that we can um, take a look at. If you go to the Options button in your Save As dialog, you want to make sure that the uh, custom map SolidWorks to DXF, DWG, is enabled first. So as long as that's enabled, what you'll have um, are a couple of different options here. And uh, what you want to sh export is a sheet metal part. Entities to export, we're going to say geometry, hidden edges, bend lines. I mean, you have all these different options here. I'm going to say bend lines, and then the bounding box as well. So if we hit OK there, It shows you what layer you want to put all this stuff on. Um, I'll just go ahead and hit OK. That's fine. So as it goes through the process, it's going to show you what it's trying to save out. Let me expand that for you. And you have your entire part here, the sheet metal part. You can see the bend lines are going to be these lighter colors over here. Then your bounding box is the uh, the outside dashed uh, line style uh, right there. And again, you can remove entities right here as well if you wanted to. Otherwise, you can j then just say save, and now you have a DXF, um, or in this case, DXF or DWG file that has all that information in it. For mold design, there was one new enhancement in 2011. It's going to be manual mode for creating parting surfaces. If you have a part similar to this that's going to be molded or cast or something like that, and you need to make a parting surface, SolidWorks, with some of the geometry here, would typically, um, especially in years past, would have a bit of an issue with uh, some of the geometry here. If we kind of uh, look at it as I type in the parting surface there, 
some of the geometry will fold in on itself as you extend out the uh, uh, the parting surface there so we can't really use that it doesn't really help us out at all so what they did was under options down here they put in a manual mode if you click on the manual mode you just look normal too what it'll do is allow you to kind of move some of these points around so if I want to move this around it'll kind of snap in you can see that kind of snap there and it'll just change your parting surface here to make it a little more uh, realistic and, and easier to to use here so that makes it look a little nicer so it didn't fold in on itself is it probably because of how close the radii were here were to each other here um, we also have an option inside of here the parting surface doesn't completely fill out you can see that it went 25 millimeters and uh, what it is is 25 millimeters outside of your parting line so if you look at it, it's 25 millimeters, but it's from the parting line up here. Well, you want that surface to come out and be even with all the rest of it. So we do have a couple of options. If you right-click on that point, you can say Start Fill Surface Region, and then wherever you want it to end, right-click on that point, and you can say End It. And with that, it's just going to fill that surface in, and it's going to use your edges here as basically a bounding box and then you have those points it's uh, basically drawing a line between those as well and it's creating the complete surface there so a couple of nice uh, really small enhancements but it makes it uh, a nice uh, clean parting surface in the end the main improvement for SOLIDWORKS utilities is the symmetry check tool We'll start with a part and uh, take a look at the symmetry check. If you go to your tools pull down, you have symmetry check right inside of there. What you want to do is choose uh, how you want to define the symmetry, either by a plane, you can do it between two parallel faces, or by two points. I'm just going to choose a plane going through the center of our part here, and then we want to just check it. So it does the check for us. <coughs> It shows the uh, unique faces, the symmetric faces, and asymmetrical faces. You'll see the different colors uh, corresponding with it as well. And then it kind of breaks it down a little bit. And it shows, you know, side A, side B, which faces are, are where. So you can kind of see those uh, right inside there. Then you have your symmetric faces. Face 1, face 2, or 4 and 2. They have the pairs of symmetry going through here. You can take a look at all those. What you can also do is save a report, and you can call it whatever you want, put it wherever you want. You can uh, add this to your design binder if you wanted to, and you can also just view the report before uh, or when you save it. So that's the symmetry check for parts. Let's take a look at the assembly now. The majority of this stuff's all symmetrical. Um, you can kind of see that here. What we want to do is again choose a face uh, or a plane that we're going to use for symmetry and go to the tools pull down and then symmetry check again. And this is just a little different as we create the uh, uh, the check here for this one. And again you can change your color settings if you want to as well. The symmetric components are going to be blue. The asymmetric are going to be this pink color. Once you hit check it's going to show you all the symmetrical stuff in blue and then the rest of it is going to be um, in that pink color. So you can kind of see there what's symmetrical and what's not. So basically the same thing between the two, uh, between assemblies and parts. Again, you can do the whole reporting uh, right here as well. So that's kind of uh, what you can do uh, with the symmetry check in 2011. The last thing we'll take a look at today is large scale design. All of these are new enhancements in 2011, uh, brand new uh, tools and features. The first one that we'll take a look at is grid system. If you want to make uh, pretty large weld mints or that kind of thing, maybe the floors to diff different buildings, something like that, we can use that uh, the grid system for that. We'll also see exporting IFC files, um, both from large scale designs as well as the walkthrough. We'll see that in a couple minutes. And the last thing is the walkthrough, which is going to give you a nice uh, collaboration tool 
and uh, give you an output of a video and AVI file that you can put on a website, give to some customers, and do that kind of thing. So those are the, the last things that we'll take a look at now. Looking at the grid system, to access it or get into the grid system, you have to go to the insert pull down and then reference geometry, and then you have the grid system right there. What this puts you into is a sketch, I'm just going to look normal to, and once you create that sketch, um, it's going to kind of put different layers out there for you. And I'm just going to uh, create the geometry to begin with. It's not going to be anything too uh, crazy or anything here. Let's start adding some dimensions. Let's say like 10 feet in that direction. 12 feet in that direction and that's that's good enough for me so as you start to create that information it looks like I'm actually looking backwards to it here there we go uh, it's gonna actually put in your grid uh, itself so as you create geometry it's gonna add letters and numbers letters going across uh, in the uh, columns there going vertical so you have your a b and c uh, then you have uh, 0, 1, and 2 with the lines that are going horizontal. So you have that uh, kind of designation for the grid itself. Now what's going to happen if we assume that this is a, a, the finish to our grid, we can exit the grid, or the sketch, and it puts you into the grid system feature. Um, what you can do is select the number of levels, how many of these things do you want, and then the distance between each one. Maybe I'll say, uh, uh, maybe say seven feet is the distance between them. So then if you look at it, it says between the different levels, it's 84 inches. You can always go back and, and change them anytime you want to. Uh, maybe it's five feet between those ones. Uh, that's fine. Um, you also have a couple of options in here, 3D sketch uh, split lines, and then you have auto number balloons which is uh, just the balloons that go across the, the uh, grid itself. We'll hit OK there, and then you can see it just creates those different levels for you, and it's just a copy of the initial sketch um, that's just copied going uh, along each way there. They also create different surface bodies along these as well, so you can use those as reference. If I expand out the grid feature itself, it has the plane that the that each sketch was applied to. So level one, level two. You have the 3D sketch, which kind of connects everything together. You can see that. And then you have your first initial sketch and the uh, surface itself. Now if you uh, right-click on the grid itself, there's an option here for view grid components. And then it has a little dialog here. If you want to show different things, you can just click in here and show the different uh, components themselves. So they give you that option as well. And again, this is good for maybe creating uh, maybe a weldment here. So if we want to, here, I'm going to actually show that. If you want to create just a weldment out of this thing, you can. Uh, just add some structural member here going all the way around and yeah, I'll actually make it something a little more normal here so we got that going across going around you, know, you can create all your different groups and everything here uh, just going between all the pieces so just going along and making all of your different uh, uh, structural members here and that'll give you a nice uh, a nice way to create pretty large and complex things um, in a pretty quick and easy way. The last thing for the webinar this week is going to be uh, the walkthrough tool and this is a pretty neat tool that they came up with for 2011. It's primarily used for uh, just kind of portraying your ideas to different customers or vendors and uh, what it's going to do is uh, give you an output of uh, motion, a video, uh, just going around your model. In this case it happens to be a pretty large model itself. Uh, so what you can do after you're done with 
something like this after even creating the video if you want to show this model to other people you can save it as an uh, an IFC uh, file type and what that is is the industry foundation class uh, IFC and a lot of uh, different uh, software applications use this um, it's primarily in the building supply chain uh, in addition to that you can use the D feature tool to uh, get rid of you know different design details and reduce the model size before saving it out as an IFC uh, file type but we'll take a look at the um, just the walkthrough itself if you go over to your display manager you're gonna find the walkthrough inside of here I don't have one in here yet so what I'm gonna do is just right click on the walkthrough say add walkthrough and then from here what's looking for is uh, different parameters for the walkthrough itself basically what the uh, floor is the avatar parameters um, so what's uh, basically your you know the floor gonna be here I'm just gonna use the top plane that's fine it should be uh, this top surface inside of here basically that's you know, that's fine um, you can also say basically where the camera is going to be and uh, so if it's like maybe six feet above the ground uh, you can of course flip the direction there um, so you have those options for your motion constraints I'm going to choose two different things I'm going to choose the, the ground again here and then I also have this spline here and I'm going to select that as a constraint you have a couple of other um, options in here as well. Turn avatar to follow paths and tree faces as infinite planes. So what I'm going to do is capture the walkthrough and what it's going to do is just kind of put you into the walkthrough itself and this is the camera view um, that's uh, the walkthroughs taking uh, hold of here. We're going to kind of go through the different options at the bottom here. You have your record, pause, you can accept your walkthrough you can cancel it. You can move the camera uh, up, down, left, right. You can zoom in, zoom out. You can move to the left, actually turning left and right, then moving forward and backwards. You can elevate your camera itself. You can see that there. Again, turning, just clicking on the buttons here. You have your speed here. I think this is a little slow, so I'll bring it right up. I'll go about eight. That's fine. So if you move, you can kind of see that what it's going to look like. And in addition to these buttons here, you can also use, uh, if you're um, in the younger generation like I am, you can use uh, the keyboard arrows and just move around. It's kind of like a first person video game almost. And if you want to move your camera around a little bit, you can use your, uh, just like your rotating a SolidWorks model, just press in on your center mouse button and then you can just move around and that's changing your camera angle itself the last thing over on the right here or almost last thing are your constraints and right now it says no constraint I can fly through whatever I want and you can kinda of see that happening here so I'm just kinda of moving around here you also have the uh, the map here so you can show or hide the map it's gonna give you basically a layout of your model itself and you can see where your spline is here and uh, your different constraints and that kind of stuff and just a basic overview of your uh, your model I'm going to kinda make sure I go out of the model a bit here and I'm going to choose a constraint I'm gonna say I want to uh, kinda walk around on the floor here so if I hit the no constraint there's a pull down and it has your two constraints that face that we selected here and then we also have the uh, the spline itself now what happens if we kind of uh, run into it looks like a curb here if I kind of run into it you'll notice that I kind of stop and I just kind of move along it well the reason for that is uh, they they like to say it's um, kind of built in um, interference detection but it's, it's more or less that that face just ends right there and that's why you don't move any further after that so it's kinda nice to move around here you can uh, kinda walk around look around different things if you want to change over to the slime all you have to do is go forward backwards and you can uh, take a look at the uh, you know move around your model and take a look at it I'm gonna start recording now
I'm going to do a little different, uh, a couple of different things. I'm going to move. I'm going to change my uh, my constraints here, and I'm going to kind of look around the model itself. So I'm going to start by just hitting record. I'm just going to start moving forward. I'm going right now along the spline itself. And it looks like I'm my computer's a little choppy and slow today, but that's all right. Uh, I'm just going to kind of move along here, and uh, we have the employee parking lot over here. I'm just going to switch my constraints just to the face here. And if we kind of move over to the side, I just download these from 3D Content Central, so, you know, looks kind of neat. Some menacing vehicles there. But then if we want to keep moving around, maybe I want to jump back onto the spline now and keep going forward. Uh, another thing you'll probably notice is as you move a little bit, I'm just going to switch again here. As you kind of move and look around, you can see a lot of things turning into uh, blocks there. Now what that's doing is just kind of saving the rendering uh, capabilities itself. It's going to be blocky now, but when you play back the entire thing, it won't uh, be blocky anymore. It'll go back to normal. So I think that's all right. Let's uh, go ahead and pause that and then I'll just say okay that that works for me. You now ha have uh, more options down here. You can play back the walkthrough or you can generate the video. The video can be generated uh, as an AVI or as a series of bitmaps or TGA files and the renderer you have the SOLIDWORKS screen which is normal. If you have the photo view um, add-in turned on you can render it uh, using Photo View 360. Um, just to let you know, it does take forever. Um, I think uh, a, about a 20 second video um, took me, I don't know, an hour and a half or so to render it, if not longer, I don't remember. Um, so that's your generate video. Let's just do a playback of the walkthrough and see what it kind of turned out to be here. I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but again, when you play back the walkthrough, you can turn on the map and take a look at where you are um, in reference to everything else here and also uh, notice the um, all the different uh, models around here they're not um, blocky like they were when we uh, did the rendering itself they've gone back to their normal um, shapes so give this another couple seconds just to see it um, I think we're we still have about 20 seconds left here but that's a good indication about what the uh, walkthrough can do. Um, like to see any anyone who comes up with anything crazy, you know, drop me a line. That's always fun to see. So that's the uh, uh, the walkthrough example that I have. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. This is going to be uh, the third out of four. There should be one more coming out uh, next uh, in a couple weeks, actually. If you could uh, just uh, type in the questions that you may have on the right-hand side of the screen, um, just raise your hand, type in a question, and uh, then we can get those answered now. All right, thanks for joining.